We've all had that experience of going upstairs and forgetting what we came up for. Now, don't worry. It doesn't mean you're getting senile. It, it, neurologists tell us, in fact, that it's entirely natural. And without some sort of clean out, our brains would quickly become swamped. Now, this mechanism is triggered by our brains observing what are called portals, going from one room to another, going up the stairs and so on, each memory lasting just as long as necessary and then being wiped by the action of passing through the portal. Hello. My name is Peter John Cooper. Welcome to the next of my 10 minute tales. This story is the most interesting and perhaps distressing example of this short term memory phenomenon. It's called the Hive Ferry. Julius Grant was an English academic who in the days of the Great Depression, thought he could make his fortune by getting onto the American lecture circuit. But no one was going to pay him the fabulous sums of money he thought he might be worth if he didn't have an interesting tale to tell. He had lived a pretty dull life cloistered in the red brick groves of academe in the fair but rather unexciting city of Leicester. And as all red brick academics, his learning was wide, if not overly deep. So he decided on a round the world trip where he would deliberately put himself into as many exciting situations as was possible on his meagre savings. He reckoned, though, that the investment would reap rich rewards. And it did, for a short time. He booked himself onto a steamer bound for Cape Town, leaving from Southampton. In order to save every penny he could, he persuaded the landlord of a pub in Hythe to allow him to park his little Austin in the pub car park, rather than storing it in a valeted garage at the docks. Having said farewell to the car, he crossed over Southampton Water by the Hythe Ferry and walked the rest of the way to the docks. The Union Castle liner Carnarvon Castle was halfway down Southampton Water and within sight of Hive that Thursday afternoon when it occurred to him that he might not have locked the car. Having crossed by the Hive ferry, all recollection of leaving his little Austin had been wiped from his memory. He certainly could not afford to send a ship to shore telegram and even though he was within waving distance of the pub and the Austin, there was no way of asking the pub landlord to go and check. With nothing to do, the nine days to Cape Town became an insufferable agony as he imagined all the rogues and ne'er-do-wells of Fawley and Dibden Purlieu surrounding his pride and joy and taking it away to be stripped down for spare parts. In the end, by dint of sheer willpower, he managed to dismiss the worst of his fears but on dark, lonely nights throughout the whole of his trip, they would return to gnaw at his composure. However, the trip itself went better than he could have imagined. 
he travelled back up the coast to the Congo, where, deep in the jungle, his academic skills as a linguist were called into play, where he found himself caught up in a rather bloody dispute between two warring tribes, and he managed to broker a peace agreement between them. Subsequently, he was able to act as their spokesman in negotiations with the Belgian mining company to arrange far better terms than they were being offered for the rights to a rich copper seam. His work concluded and with a sheaf of valuable shares in his breast pocket, he returned to the coast where he picked up a tramp steamer heading across the Atlantic for Venezuela. There he attached himself to an expedition deep into the Amazon rainforest and he was able to use his knowledge of the cultures of the region to identify the exact spot in the jungle where an ancient city was hidden which proved to surpass the importance of Machu Picchu. In Peru, he picked up a survey ship and following a trip to the Galapagos, he was able to point out to the scientists on board a few of the errors that Darwin had made in his observations of finches and iguanas. And so his journey continued. Success after success. In Japan, he made some observations concerning metallurgy in a bronze foundry, which enabled them to improve the quality of the production of their wonderful artworks. In China, he offered some ideas about the curing of leaves in a tea plantation. In India, he avoided the officers of the Raj and having made the acquaintance of a couple of pandits and gurus, he pointed out some novel yoga positions that would enable deeper meditative states and was able to show his prowess with a rifle by stalking and shooting a man-eating tiger. In the Middle East, he discussed interesting rock formations with geologists looking for oil and spent a few happy days unearthing treasures with the celebrated archaeologist Max Malawin's expedition to excavate archaeological sites in the Balik Valley to the west of the Kabur Basin as well as giving some creative writing tips to the famous archaeologist's novelist wife. In the Levant, he contributed some novel uses for spices in the cookery of one of the foremost restaurants. Altogether, a stunning year full of incident and achievement and not an inconsiderable improvement to his bank balance. But on the boat back from Cairo through the Mediterranean, the old panic began to rise in his mind again. Would the car still be there when he returned to Hive? And in one piece and despite the fact that he was not wealthy enough to buy a whole fleet of austin rubies the closer he got to home the greater the anxiety became he could barely contain himself as they passed up southampton water within sight of hive again he had hardly stop himself from jumping overboard and swimming the few yards that separated them from the pier. Almost before the last of the mooring lines had been made fast at the Union Castle line dock, 
he was sprinting down the gangway, waving his passport, shouting, British, British, emergency, let me through. Then he was running flat out through the back streets, desperate to make the last ferry trip of the day across Southampton water. On the ferry at last, he was filled with fear and anticipation. And he couldn't wait for the little pier train, but ran at full tilt the length of the pier until stepping off onto dry land. The memory came flooding back to him with full cinematic clarity of of course he had locked the car. He could remember every detail of the changing his little valise from left to right hand, turning the key in the lock, setting off the with the keys jingling in his pocket. He chuckled when he realised ah, how foolish he had been to worry. Ah, the high ferry was one of those portals where the, the brain doctors tell us memories are wiped clean as surely as Chiron's boat takes us over the sticks to drink the waters of Lethe. And later, in the snug at the pub, he thanked the landlord for the use of his car park and asked if there was anything he could do by way of payment. Well, it's a slow night tonight and there's not a lot of fun to be had in Hive. Why don't you tell us all about your travels? <laughs> don't miss anything out now. And the regulars turned their chairs and leant forward in expectation. Julius began. I set off across the ferry at, I, um, I, after the ferry, I, do you know, I really can't remember what I went over there for. <laughs> Thank you for watching this 10 minute tale. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and you'll be reminded when there's another tale next week. Goodbye for now.